This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards and Tony Schiavone inviting you into our respective podcast studio, his man cave, my living room. This is my dining room. I don't know. It's a small ass condo. It's all kind of the same room. Anyway, uh, today we have a special guest and his name is Tony Schiavone. Hooray. Hey, I'm not answering anything. Nothing. All right. This has been AEW Unrestricted. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Tune into Dynamite on Wednesdays. Hey, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so it's funny because early on when we first started doing this podcast, um, we were in Miami, I think, and yep. we were supposed to have Tony Khan on the podcast and right. he had to cancel last minute cause he was negotiating our extension with TNT and you turned to me. Oh yeah. No, uh, was way more important. Um, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you turned to me and looked at all the people in the room that had flown out to film this podcast and said, why don't we do one with you? And I'm like, uh, okay, cool. Great. Because I had, no one really knew who I was and you're the voice of everyone's childhood. Mm. So I've had people ask me on Twitter for pretty much since then, when are you going to turn it around and put Tony in the hot seat? Oh, okay. So that is today. Hooray. Oh. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm incredibly nervous because you're probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest commentators in the history of wrestling. Well, it's it's very nice of you to say that. I don't consider myself that. Of course you don't. You're a humble uh, man. Because uh, to me, the greatest announcers in wrestling are, are number one, Jim Ross, and then number two, everybody else that I grew up watching. Mm, who'd you grow up watching? Uh, Bob Cottle, uh, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, who I was very fortunate to get to work with. Uh, Gordon Soley, who I was very fortunate to get to work with. Gorilla Monsoon, who I was very fortunate to get to work with, uh, to me, and and of course on a, on another level, Jesse Ventura and Bobby Heenan, uh, all the guys that I knew as a wrestling fan growing up, starting in the early seventy or I'm sorry, late seventies through the eighties, I I eventually got to work with. So uh, yeah, so I, I appreciate you saying that, but uh, I don't accept that. I'm just another job guy. Just I, another, comma, jabroni. Jabroni. Just a mm -hmm. commentator jabroni. I love it. Right. Uh, before we get into it, I want to talk about your accolades because we definitely talk about this with all of our guests. Mm -hmm. uh, your biggest accolade is Wrestling Observer Newsletter called you the worst television announcer in 1999 and 2000. Yeah. Are you proud of that fact? I'm proud of the fact that I, that I maintained... Uh, I maintained being a bad announcer during a bad promotion. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. no, you've you've been very open about kind of your thoughts during that time period. Yeah, I uh, I really think that uh, first of all, if, if I can be so blunt. Oh please, this is unrestricted, Tony. Dave Meltzer, who I know and who I like, and I've been uh, friendly with for years, can kiss my ass. That's number one. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was not a good time, and I and I uh, people I've I've had people since then say, oh, the the matches were so bad that it drug you down. Well, that's an excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, when the matches are really bad, is when you have to shine. It's when you have to up your game and make it. And maybe I was well, not maybe I was a little too much over the top. And I go back and I listen to those days, ninety nine and two thousand. I go back and I listen to those days or watch that, and it it, it bugs me. Because I was nothing but a hype machine, and I tried to overhype it, and I was pushed to do that too, and I get it. But still, you got to accept responsibility for it. I, I could have done a much better job, and I was kind of checked out at that time. I'm giving you a, a, a litany of excuses here, which I shouldn't, but I get it. I was bad. We were bad. Let's move on, basically. But I think there's something to that. Like you're. I really respect you for a number of reasons, but one of the things I really like is that even though you've been doing this for so long, I know that you're willing to look at the work you've done and evaluate it and learn from it, even if it's, you know, this last Wednesday or if it's 20 years ago. And that's something I really admire about you. So even though you were terrible then, uh, mm -hmm. you were in a terrible situation, but right. I think you did the best with what you could do. Excuses or not. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, that uh, that had left such a bad taste in my mouth uh, that uh, I left wrestling for a long, long time. And uh, and now that I look back on it, I, I didn't realize exactly how much how many fans out there really did overall like my work. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and and so I'm right now. I'm 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 the product of nostalgia. Uh, nostalgia is big, and so I'm reaping the benefits of that. And I and that does not that fact does not escape me. But I, I go back and I look at that, and uh, I try to grow from it, and I try to get better. And I I accept change. I, I think I accept change uh, more than most people do, and I'd embrace agree with change. That. I'd agree with uh, that. So. so uh, talking a little bit about I mean we, we've talked about this uh, privately a lot um, and I think we both said it that working for AEW like we're having the time of our lives mm-hmm. so tell us how did your AEW story happen it's a long one well <clears throat> we've got some time Tony okay <laughs> I uh, first of all I, kn- I knew from my friends um and I say my friends, Conrad Thompson and, and I have been doing a podcast for quite a while. And Conrad had told me a few years back that it looks like that Tony Khan's new promotion is going to be on TNT. He said, what do you think about that? I said, I don't think anything about it. I'm out of wrestling with the exception of doing your podcast. And um, so it, it did interest me that. I thought, man, that's, that's a great idea to get somebody else's podcast on or somebody else's product on a major, a major cable channel, cable channel. So, uh, that being said, I never did at all ask for a job or call Tony Khan or call Cody or call, just check with the bucks. Didn't do anything. And, so who and Conrad, reached out to you? What's that? Who reached out to you then? Uh, Cody did. And let, let me tell you how that story went. Uh, I was, a pro, I was in uh, 20, uh, in 20, I'll, I'll just try to get this brief story down. In 2015, I, at the end of 2015, I had lost my job with the radio station, uh, WSB, and I had been working as their sports director and working as an editor on their website for a number of years, actually for uh, uh, 13 years. Uh, I lost that job. I, my contract was not renewed. They wanted to cut back. And so in, in December 2015, I was thrown out, basically. Uh, no job and no uh, health insurance for someone in their 50s. Uh, that's a pretty scary thing. So I still work for the University of Georgia doing uh, on their football broadcast, on their basketball broadcast. And I still have the job with the Braves AAA team. So I did have work, but I didn't have enough to really supplement my income and pay the house here. So uh, I got the camp family together. So I'm going to have to sell the house, guys. I, I don't think I can afford this. So hung in there. And uh, 2016 was a terrible year financially for the Shivani family. I started working at Starbucks. Uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, I needed the job and was looking for health insurance, which they offered. And number two, I really like Starbucks and it's I like the people. Yeah, I like the people. And I, I discovered by working in there that I was right. It was a great place to work. Now, everybody has Starbucks stories that work there and some people don't like it and some people do. I love working there. I, I really it was a great year and a half working there. Uh, so anyway, at the end of 2016, during 2016, I did a NWA Fan Fest where I did a, a panel with Jim Valley. Conrad Thompson was in that, uh, and he saw how funny I was, how irreverent I was, how I was obviously talking honestly. And he approached me in 2017 to do a podcast, and we started the podcast. That podcast led to us doing some crazy things online, of which Tony Khan saw and liked. Um, and I got to know Bruce Pritchard. Because Bruce does a podcast with Conrad as well. Bruce told me at the beginning of uh, 2019, he said, I'm going to go back and work for Vince. If you'll give this was like January 2019, he said, if you'll give me a few months, I will, uh, I'll contact you because I think you can come to work here. He did contact me on a Sunday in the summertime of that year. And he said, Vince wants you to come back to work for us. And I said, great. Uh, What are we talking about? He said, we still don't know yet. But we know we'd like for you to be a producer because we know you like to produce. We know you you like to work behind the scenes. We'll be back in touch. I said, got it. So you get a you get an offer like that thinking, man, you know, things may be on the way up. So do I call my wife? No, I call Conrad. I say, I just got offered a job by from the WWE. And he said, that's great. 
hung up the phone. Two minutes later, I got a text from Cody. <laughs> How did he know? <laughs> well, Conrad called him. Uh, and he said, uh, Cody says, I don't want you to go to work for the WWE. And I said, okay, good. And that's all I said. And then he said, will you accept a call from Tony Khan? I said, sure. Tony called me. We talked for an hour. Of course. Uh, over an hour. Because you know how he can go. And, he goes. Uh, <clears throat> and he goes. So it, it was very interesting. And he said, I'm going to have you come down to Jacksonville. Now, during this time, the WWE kept talking to me. And I never told the WWE that Tony Khan had an interest in me. I was just listening to what they had to say. So they would call me and they would say, <clears throat> we don't uh, we don't have our ducks in a row yet. We'll be back in touch with you. Bruce called, said, Vince uh, is very much interested. Really want you to come here and, and end your career. I said, OK, well, then, then make me an offer. Right. And so they had an HR person call, call me and they say, how much do you need? Well, I, I threw the ball way up in the air on that one. And they said, OK, we'll be back in touch with you. <laughs> Meanwhile, I go down and talk to Tony Khan. And uh, I met with Tony. It was an all day meeting at the stadium. And I knew immediately I wanted to work there. And I also had a, a wife of mine who have, we've been married now 39 years who told me, if you take a job back with the WWE, I'm going to divorce your ass. So, uh, but I still, but I didn't play two sides against the middle. I didn't. So I was just waiting and waiting to hear. Tony offered me something phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to work there, but I was going to l listen to what the WWE had to say. I mean, you're and, a smart guy. Enough, like, that's what you have to do is that if you've got yeah. multiple people talking, you have to listen yeah. to all the offers. It's so, it's just right. pure business. Sure it is. And and I was not one that called the WWE and say, listen, Tony Khan has offered me this or go to Tony. And I did tell Tony, I said, I did hear from the WWE. And Tony says, well, if they offer you a million dollars, take it. I said, don't worry, I will. Uh, and Lois told me, it doesn't matter what they offer you, don't take it. So anyway, uh, she has a bad feeling about them. So anyway, I uh, the uh, Monday, the, the week of SummerSlam, they contacted me and said, we will be back. And th this was, I was now just talking to the HR, one of the HR ladies. We'll be back in touch with you uh, right after SummerSlam. So the Monday after SummerSlam, I get a call first thing in the morning. And the lady says from the WWE says, thank you for your interest, Mr. Shivani. We have nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And I went, uh, you guys contacted me. Yeah. Okay. I immediately turned around, called Tony. I said, I'm in. Yes. And th that's how it happened, basically. Weren't and, you uh, at the first Double or Nothing? Uh, yes, I was. You're we watching had, as a uh, fan. Watching as a fan. Here's a, a little crazy story about that was... Um, I really felt bad about that. I, I, I'm, I'm honestly did. We were doing. This, uh, Conrad has uh, these uh, fan fest uh, that he calls Starcast, and he he tries to have them around. Uh, he had the first one around All In, uh, and so we had one at Double or Nothing. We had one over at Caesars. So Conrad said, "Hey, a bunch of us are going. We want you to go with us." And I went, "I'm not going." He said, "Come on, you'll sit beside me at ringside, and we'll go." I said, I'm not going. And I had my son, Matt, who works with us, uh, worked with us behind the scenes. And Conrad said, your son's going to go. He wants you to step beside him. I said, I'm not going. I'm just not going to go. And, he, and then he said, oh, so he convinced me to go. And then, of course, he didn't go. Uh, so I'm, I'm sitting in front of a ringside with uh, Mike Dawkins, who's our lawyer, and Matt Schiavone and Dave Silva and a bunch of us. Sitting, and I'm sitting front row freaking ringside. And I'm really pissed. But and here's why I'm really pissed. Because the show is about the kids in the ring. It ain't about me. And I know some jack off out there is going to make it about me being there on social media. And they did. Somebody took a picture of me yawning. Shivani seems to be bored. Oh, God bless America. Kiss my ass. I wasn't bored. Okay. And, and that's why I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be seen there. Uh, but I'm glad I went. In a way, because I saw some great stuff. I really did. And so uh, that's the story of me being front row ringside. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a swerve by Conrad to get me there. So Damn. All right. So before before we take a break, mm -hmm. one, of, one of my favorite things I've ever seen working with you was your call when Sting debuted. 
and mm-hmm. just how absolutely wild you went. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the response to your response was just over the top and everyone saying, oh my God, Shivani's losing his mind. This is great. Uh, when did you find out Sting was there? Because I found out right through when I came through the curtain, I gave him a fist bump and went, yo, it's Sting and then walked mm-hmm. away because they kept that pretty secret for all of us. And I know very, very few select people knew. Well, I had known that I had known that there was a chance that Sting would come to work for us. I think that had been bantered around quite a bit. The last thing I had heard was that, well, Sting may go to work for the for AEW, but he's concerned. You know, he's a, a, of his time with the WWE. He doesn't know what he wants to do, and that's all I heard. Didn't know when it was happening. And then when we got there the day of. I mean, I get there early in the backstage area, and Cody says, your buddy's here today. <laughs> and you I went said, Conrad Thompson? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, dude, I got a lot of buddies. Yeah. He's, I said, who, who, who are you talking Brent about? Baker? He said, yeah, my best buddy. <laughs> I said, uh, who are you talking about? He said, Sting. I said, you are shitting me. He said, no. He said, and, uh, he said you just got to keep it quiet. I said, don't worry. I, I'm good at keeping stuff quiet. I come from the old school. And uh, so I did, with the exception of, I, I did this because I knew I, I wasn't I wasn't really letting on that I knew that Sting was there. But Mark Quinn of Private Party is such a big Sting fan. I know there's a lot more. But uh, Mark Quinn of Private Party would always come up to me and go, it's Sting. And I'd go, give him a thumbs up. Even to the point to where when Mark Quinn, one of his matches, I went, it's Mark Quinn. Oh, my no one God. got that, but he did. So he's a big Sting fan. So. I saw him during the day and I said, hey, buddy, go, don't get too excited about tonight's show. And he goes, takes his headphones off. He said, I'm just in the Battle Royal. I, how excited can I get? I said, just don't get too excited. Wow. Hit him up a second time. Hey, buddy, don't get too excited about tonight's show. That's all I said to him. And then when Sting came out, uh, Stevie, our, our straight stage director, handed me a note from Mark Quinn and said, OMG. Um, so I, I knew that it was happening. And I didn't know how we were going to present it, but Tony brought me in. He said, and he, he told, he told all the other announcers, he says, when sting comes out, I want Shivani to hit that it sting line. Yes. And, and he said, I want you to do it. Cause that's really going to sell it. He said, I want you to say it's sting sting is back on TNT for the first time since March 26, 2001. And sting is an AEW. And so I hit those, I think I hit two of those lines and Jr. hit sting is an AEW, which I thought really worked out well. Uh, but yeah, great response for it. My voice cracked. Someone said, your voice cracked. I said, well, guess what, dude? It's sting. <laughs> it's sting and I'm older. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, it's not 2001. It's uh, 2020. Right. Uh, so you can't really worry about what you sound like. Like it's really just as long as the reaction is organic and authentic. I think that's what's most important. But you know, sure. I'm just telling you what sure. you already know. So to uh, to wrap this up about Sting, I uh, or that night, I think that my excitement was authentic. It was authentic when they told me earlier in the day. And uh, I just wish I just wish I would have seen him walk through the backstage area oh. uh, going to the uh, going to the gorilla position, because that would have been that would have been worth me being back there just to see everybody's reaction because everybody's reaction out front, you know, all the wrestlers who sat ringside, I mean, those kids were giving each other high fives and and everything. So I told Sting uh, the next day, I said, listen, you need to do this. And and I think he understood, and I, I hope he was going to do it anyway. I said, you need to go out today and mingle with these kids because you're a god to these guys and oh, girls. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I said, you need to go out and just say hello. It will mean the world to these people. And I think he did on on Thursday, mm-hmm. uh, and he probably didn't get it. I mean, he knows he's Sting, right? But he probably didn't get it like I get it. Uh, how much that what we did in the past means to uh, the young the youngsters out there, uh, absolutely, who are not only you know not only wrestlers but uh, work behind the scenes. So it's a great moment. Absolutely, long great story moment. for a great moment. It was a great one. Yeah, I mean, it's a, one of many in the year we've had for Dynamite so far. Yes. This is AEW Unrestricted. I've got Tony Schiavone in the hot seat. We're going to talk about a couple of those special moments. One thing I'd like to talk about is State Farm Insurance. And I say I like to talk about that because I've been a State Farm customer, a member, if you will, since 1981, since the year that I was married. State Farm 
as surprisingly great rates on both auto and homeowners. Tony, you've been a member of State Farm since before I was born. There you go. That means that they must have like great customer service. They've got yes, agents do. available everywhere. Like to be a member of a company for that long, you have to be really, really happy with their policies. I'm happy with their policies. And now I'm happier, Aubrey, with their easy to use technology. Because back then, you'd have to have the insurance card in your wallet. It was a paper insurance card or like a cardboard insurance card. Now you have it on your phone. You have, they have a great app and you have your insurance card right on your smartphone. So the technology that is advanced in the world has also advanced insurance in insurance, thanks to our people at State Farm. So you can manage your coverage, pay your bill, file a claim, all just from your phone. Some That's you already right. carry around with you. Who That's needs right, cardboard cards anymore? Jeez. No boy. A, a great <laughs> price with even greater service. So Aubrey, as I always say, when you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You say that all the time, Tony. I do. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards doing her best Tony Schiavone impression and interviewing Tony Schiavone. We've talked a little bit about Sting, how you got to AEW. Uh, one of the things I want to touch on, and we talked about it when we first had TK on the podcast, I think, uh, the Atlanta shows and how instrumental you were to those happening. Like... We recorded six episodes of television in a single day, just for those that maybe missed the podcast. Like uh, everything was shutting down across the United States. The pandemic was really starting to like reach new heights. We had sort of been kicked out of Florida. We had to drive to Atlanta and just we didn't know when we were going to be live on television again. So we had to get a fuckload of stuff in the can just to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. recorded commentary from, I think, noon until midnight. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Uh, that was, that was, that was a, it was really a great experience for me for a number of reasons, uh, because I felt like I was really an instrumental part of something at a very important time for our company. You, you, obviously we all like to feel valued and we all like to feel important, but that was really important because we had to get shows in the can the, the night before, you know, we had taped some things the night before and Tony called me back to his trailer and he said, hey, we've got to put together these shows because tomorrow's going to be our last day. So he sat there with a with a piece of paper and, and, and a pen and he and I formatted out, I don't know, six shows, six weeks worth of shows. I think it ended up being four weeks worth of shows, but we formatted six weeks worth. And I was just sitting there and he was writing down and you to deal with Tony on a on a professional level. Uh, during a, a TV taping day, you have to really be on your toes mm -hmm. because he's all over the place uh, in a good way. Uh, he's thinking about this. He's thinking about that. He gets a call. He gets a text from somebody in the truck. So I just hung with him and we just formatted all these shows. So we went into the next day. I'm thinking I've got six shows to do and I'm the only one here. And I was told I was going to have a Cole Cabana with me a little bit. Somebody else is going to be with me. And then when I got there the next day, Tony says, Jericho's coming in. He's going to be with you the entire time. Yeah. And that was, to me, that was exciting. I remember hearing about that, like, Jericho wasn't there, called Tony and said, what do you need from me? And drove right. all the way from Tampa to Atlanta on very, very right. short notice just to kind of give right. you uh, someone to throw some stuff against. And sure. I think that was I think that was maybe one of the first times we had Jericho on commentary and now he comes back occasionally for the bigger shows and bigger story elements but the two of you meshed so incredibly well. Yeah. Talk a little I, bit I, I about working with, with Jericho. Well, look, uh I've known Chris for a long long time. I, I feel that I was uh, instrumental in, in his career because he came in, came to WCW in the 90s and you know, I was there when he first started with us and he went on to be a, a major star. I told Chris this many times, Chris, you were the first unified world champion that WWE ever had. And he says, yeah, but uh, you do understand that that night I won the title. I wasn't the main event. It was Hogan and Rock. I said, it doesn't matter. You are the, f they cannot take that away from you. Of all the people they, and I know it was an angle. I get it with Mr. McMahon. But I said, the one thing they can never take away from you, you were the first unified champion between WCW and the WWE. And he said, yeah, I get that. So I realized 
well, what a big star he is. And I also realized how much he thinks and cares about the business and puts an effort into his character. I wish everybody did. Uh, that's not slight on anybody, but I think uh, to me, Chris Jericho is kind of like Diamond Dallas Page was back in the day. He's always thinking about what can I do to make myself better or come up with an angle. So I started, and, and Tony Khan loved it. He said, you and Jericho were just tremendous. And I felt that we did have a great relationship, and we did have a great working relationship. And, and I like to think I can work with anybody because I never fight for broadcast time. I never fight to try to get my, quote, unquote, try to get my shit in. I never try to do that. I let Chris Jericho's Chris Jericho. He's a big star. They want to hear him talk. And the only thing I need to do, basically the only thing I need to do, Aubrey, is welcome everybody back. Call the one, two, three, and pitch to a break. <laughs> that's, that's basically all I need to do. Chris Jericho can fill it up uh, all the time. And that's why when I've worked with Excalibur, uh, I told Excalibur, I said, you take it, buddy. You know, we, he and I have worked on uh, a lot of the uh, buy-in shows together. And Excalibur said, do you want to take the lead? I said, no, man, do it. You're the, I, I, don't, I never fight for that. I, and so I let Chris Jericho be Chris Jericho. And I think it really, really worked out. And I think we had a great relationship. And even somebody said, and I don't know, somebody said, man, it was like Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan back in the day. And I'm thinking, wow. Now, that is quite a compliment, but I'm not so sure it was that good. That's but maybe it praise. was. I high don't know. Praise. That is high praise. Yeah. One of the so things it was great working that, with. One of the things that I really appreciated, like, I know listening to it back because, I mean, I didn't watch wrestling back in the day. I've, I've told that to many people. And to me... To you and me, like you're just a coworker, and I know you have sure. a long, illustrious history. But one of the things that really stuck out to me in those Atlanta shows is you, you talk about not getting your shit in, but I think that you can adapt so well to a situation. Uh, Excalibur is our play by play and mm -hmm. he wasn't there. And just seeing you immediately and seamlessly transition into play by play so that Jericho could do color commentary. I immediately was just like, oh, my God, Shivani's the best. He understands exactly what he needs to provide to the product at any moment. Mm -hmm. And there's many people on our roster that are capable of doing that. But it's just one of the many things that you've done that I really appreciate. Well, thanks for saying that. I, I, I get that from, I think, uh, I think starting in the uh, in the early 80s. And, uh, you know, we mentioned uh, we meant I mentioned Bob Cottle and Gordon Soley and Jim Ross and uh, the guys who are the, the top of the line play by play guys. I, I think I. I think I learned that back in the 80s that your job was to, as an announcer, put over the talent. And that means the, the guys in the ring and, or in our case, the guys or girls in the ring and or your color commentator. That's your job to do that. So I always knew what my job was and I've always took it seriously. So I am, I was during those days, when we were in Atlanta that one day, and I think I ended up doing 26 matches or something like that. It was something crazy. Um, I, I think I realized that my job was not only to get the talent over, but it was also to help Jericho get over, which he doesn't need to get over because he's over. Right. But, he's Jericho. But Right. But, it, but to help him get over as a color commentator and get his – just make sure that Chris Jericho was Chris Jericho, not Chris Jericho – fighting for time with Tony Schiavone. So. Exactly. So what are some of your favorite matches that you've called at AEW so far? Oh, in AEW so far? Yeah. Well, my favorite match is uh, Revolution. The tag match. The Bucks against uh, Omega and uh, Hangman. Why That's was my that favorite one, one. Why was that one your favorite? It, I don't... I, I, well, because there was... I, the only thing I can tell you is that there was a moment in that match, and I can't tell you when it was, that it hit me that we were, that something big is, uh, we were in the middle of a special match. And, and I don't know why that is, but it's, uh, it's only hit me like that a couple of times in my career uh, as a fan and as a, as a broadcaster that, man, something really, something great's going on. And I just think the, you know, I know I got six stars from Dave Meltzer, who, by the way, can kiss my ass. Yep. Fuck him. Uh, okay. uh, He's a great um, guy. <laughs> oh, yes, he, he is. Uh, but uh, I just realized that, you know, I, I'm seeing guys for uh, do their thing. And I'm seeing something that and I know we had been doing it since October. Uh, but I'm also seeing uh, I'm kind of seeing a transition from what I had been used to as an announcer 
in tag team wrestling to the to the new way they're doing things. A lot of high spots, a lot of dives. I mean, there wasn't there was some, but there wasn't the old school Anderson Brothers type grab a headlock and you know it just and they told told a great story and it was a great story about Hangman and Kenny and and the Bucks and the problem with the uh, the elite uh, and I thought that that was just uh, was a great story. That's that is that's my favorite match. I I really enjoyed. Even though it didn't last long, I really enjoyed Brody beating up Cody to win the TNT Championship. Oh, because it was it was so unexpected, and Brody is just tremendous uh, a worker and one of the great guys of all time. And Cody's my you know I, I have a obviously a great tie to his family. I just thought that was just so well done and so well unexpected that I really enjoyed that. I, I really enjoyed the unexpected things. Uh, and that uh, Orange Cassidy beating Chris Jericho, dumping him in the vat of uh, Mimosa oh, so was, good. A, was another good one because it was unexpected. I mean, I thought for sure Chris Jericho was going to go over. And, and that's one of the things I love about Tony Khan is that he doesn't let me know anything. I was going mean, to ask, like, how yeah. much do you know going into a show? You obviously have the oh. format that you follow. You know what matches are next. And you know mm-hmm. all of those things. But do you actually know who's going over in any match? Well, sometimes I do uh, if I ask. They won't. They won't necessarily come tell me unless there's something they want me to say, and that's. I, I think that is the more important about knowing the finish, is knowing what you want to get across. Right. And sometimes that's knowing the finish. Um, I, I think it's important that you know we we get the format, and you know, like Tony will say, like the Sting thing, at the end of the the Cody tag team match with Darby and Team Taz, uh, we have like seven minutes for post match angle. And the only thing Tony said during the uh, during the uh, during the meeting was, "It's going to be great. It'll be a lot of fun. You guys will like." It. That's it. He That's didn't it. say st- he didn't say Sting will come in. So then, by talking to Cody, I knew. And if there's a match that there's a finish that they want me to get over, I certainly will, you know, say that. But I would just soon not not know exactly what's going. I I didn't know. I didn't know uh, Don Callis and Kenny Omega were running out of the building. I don't think anyone knew. Yeah. And uh, and when Don Callis said, hey, we're going to see you Tuesday, I remember thinking, oh, shit, he fucked up the day. We're on Wednesday. But then he said, you know, he said impact. And I went, oh, good God. I didn't really know that was coming. No. And so that, yeah. And so uh, that was, so I, I don't know, always know the finishes, but I do know where we're going to go or where they want me to go. And um uh, if they want to tell me, tell me. And if I think I need to know, I'll ask and they'll tell me. But, you know, let me portray it like uh, any play by play guy would. Right. Yeah. It kind of gives it that more sports like feel. Yeah, sure. Like you never know how a football game's going to end. So why would you yeah. call it like you do? And not only that, my job is really easy now. It really is. <laughs> why is it so uh, easy? Because I got JR and Excalibur. They just carry the load and you pop in. Just yeah. Like, oh, I mean, my God. It's, it, it's like Conrad Thompson said to Conrad. And Conrad and I have been long friends, and I, and I owe him so much really getting me back in the wrestling business. Uh, Conrad says, you got the greatest job in the world. Oh, so you are stealing money. I said, what do you mean? He said, the only thing you say is, you're right, JR. You're right, Excalibur. You're right, JR. You're right, Excalibur. You're putting over uh, your boys. <laughs> that's right. It's important. But, but really, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's teamwork. I mean, it is. Uh, and uh, I think we work well as a team, and, uh, and I really enjoy the uh, – the relationship that we all have. We've got just fantastic relationship. I mean, we, we say it all the time and I'm sure people are sick of hearing it, but we're all one family and we're all working to make yep. this product as good as possible. And I don't, I don't care if they're sick of hearing it or not. I'm going to keep saying it. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got a, a number of fan questions for mm. Tony Schiavone coming up. This is AEW unrestricted Aubrey Edwards and Tony Schiavone shooting the shit. This is a. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for the conversation so far, Tony. Uh, no problem. Has I ever, ever on this uh, the podcast told the story about how you and I started working together on this podcast? No, you should tell that mm-hmm. story. Yeah, it was the uh, it was our first show was in DC. Washington. Yeah, DC. in DC. And Nick Sobic came to me and he said, "Hey, we really want you to do our podcast because I had I've had a lot of success with what happened when a lot of success really and." Uh, I said, okay. He said, is there someone here you'd like to work with? I said, well, I don't really know that many people here now. I know some people, but 
give me some time to think about it. So, uh, early, later in the day, I, uh, we were trying to take a picture, I believe, if you'll recall. Oh my God. Picture. I remember this now. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Ta- try, trying to take the team picture. And, and you and I, I had said hello to you. We kind of introduced each other or whatever. And so I was standing there while we were trying to get the team picture together and you came down, you came flying down and you said, I don't know who was standing there with me. You was trying to say, I'm trying to find the fucking photographer and I can't find that goddamn fucking photographer anywhere. <laughs> and I said, that's who I want to work with. Immediately when you said that, the way you said it, I probably didn't get the words right. I, you probably cussed a lot more than I'd said. Probably. But yeah. But I went to Nick Sobek. I said, Aubrey Edwards, I want to work with her. She's got a great personality. And and that's how it happened. So I was going to say, you go. like, you probably didn't end up thinking about it for very long because Sobek told me later that day, like, yeah, we want you on the podcast. And yeah, I'm just like, sure. OK, whatever. Oh, by the way, who's the who's the co-host? And they're like, Tony Schiavone. I'm like, OK, that's not intimidating at all. Just a guy that sits in front <laughs> of a microphone literally every episode of television. No big deal. Uh, no. But yeah, sure. Like, I just wanted to do whatever I could to help. AEW mm-hmm. be better, right? Yeah. And right. we talk about it a lot. Like, we, we both love working here. We want to do what we can to make this place last as long as possible. And I yep. know for me personally, you've taught me a ton about just even like little, little tiny bits about broadcasting because this is nothing on the scale of commentary for national television. But anyway, I digress. It was, it was a fantastic day. Definitely a yeah, very memorable moment i remember running down the ramp saying i can't find a goddamn photographer <laughs> we we ended up never actually taking the picture by the way no we never did no no, no one was ready um mm. anyway i wanted to get to some fan questions oh boy. um yeah no there's some good ones here uh okay this first one's pretty terrible though um dr Britt baker dmd on twitter asks uh hey tony who's your favorite female at aew my favorite female is dr Britt baker dmd who paid you to say that answer uh i I cannot disclose my how I where I get my money. Why are you not making eye contact when I ask you that question? I was looking at this uh, paycheck I got in from some dental uh, <laughs> service. Oh God! Oh, it's a refund for the dental work I got. Wink, wink, wink. I like it. Yeah. So we have a question from Jordan on Twitter. The recent rise of AEW has seen many lost friends from the glory days of WCW rediscover their love of professional wrestling. So as a WCW child turned AEW fan, you'd like to know, how has AEW helped you rediscover your love for pro wrestling? Hmm. I think it has helped me in that I and I I kind of realized this on a much smaller scale. I did some work for MLW and Court Bauer uh, on BN Sports um, before I started with uh, AEW. And I, I realized back then that there are people out there, and many of them are wrestlers, who uh, loved my commentary and, and, and remembers me as the voice of their childhood. So for me to do their matches was a big deal. And they all quote unquote, put me over. And I realized that if, if by me being who I am and me being the person that had been doing all these matches for all these years can help these guys and girls enhance their career, help them make more money, help them uh, move up in the, in the ladder in professional wrestling, then I, then I, then I, I should probably take my job seriously. And it helped me rekindle my love for wrestling because I always thought my job was to put people over and to make them bigger than life stars. And so now I feel like I'm doing that again. And I just kind of really got back into it just by that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel I was a part of the team. You're you know? damn good at it. Yeah. We've, That's why Aubrey Edwards, I have never seen in my life a greater referee aw, than Aubrey Edwards. Checks in the mail, man. Drew on the beat on Twitter. Um, uh, what kind of relationship did you have with Pat Patterson, who unfortunately has left us recently and yeah. gone to the next life? Um, did he ever give you any advice? I don't know if he gave me any advice, but when I first when I interviewed with Vince McMahon in 1989 at Vince's house, Pat was there 
and I got to know Pat. And I was I was very fortunate in that one year I worked with Vince that I traveled on Vince's uh, private plane to television, and I also rode between towns. We would go out and do uh, we would go out and do superstars one night and challenge the next. And we would also so we would fly into one town, do superstars, drive to another town, do challenge, and then fly back. And I would ride uh, in the car with Vince and Pat and Bruce Pritchard, Kevin Dunn. And I got to know, I got to know uh, Pat. He had a great sense of humor and he was always thinking about the business. He always, uh, even when we, a bunch of us were cutting up in the car, he was always like somewhere else. And he would turn to Vince and, Hey, I got an idea about the finish of that match. So I knew that he was like, he was thinking about wrestling more than any of us were thinking about wrestling all the time. And, he was also he was also very funny about his sexuality and he <laughs> who and is he, it and, nowadays though? <laughs> okay, exactly. But this is now we're talking eighty nine now, right? True, true, true. And, and so he was I mean, he wrestled in an era where you had to keep it quiet. And as and this is uh, listen, I uh, I've said a lot of bad things on other podcasts about the people in the WWE. But this is one thing I can say about Vince and the company back then. They did not care about Pat's sexuality. They did not care that Pat was gay, and they accepted him for it. And thus, Pat was very relaxed with us about talking about it and making jokes and everything. And and we all got along, and I just thought that was so cool that we could accept him, and we all loved him and could travel with him. And he just always was – he was a lot of fun. Uh, and I, I got to meet uh, Louis, his um, – his friend, his best friend, I guess today it would be called his husband. And we all got along together. We all went to Christmas parties together. And it was a great experience. That's wonderful. It was a great experience. And uh, and I really think that he was instrumental in me uh, leaving Jim Crockett Promotions and working for the WWF back then, called that, uh, because uh, he, was, uh, he advised Vince on who he liked to see on TV. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, did I learn anything from him? Yeah, I learned that uh, you. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your sexuality. It doesn't matter what you think. Uh, you're a person and accept a person for that. So I think I learned a lot from him because I I come from a, uh, there's, I was 89. I left uh, my hometown in 1981. So eight years before that, I had uh, lived in a very redneck uh, town in the southern, in the south in the hills and I never really experienced anything like this. And, uh, it, it helped me grow as a person. And I, I really, uh, uh, feel that Pat was a part of that. I think that's one of the really interesting things about wrestling is the kind of people it attracts are all very different from different walks mm-hmm. of life, different backgrounds, different sexualities, different, mm-hmm. um, races, religions. And, that's one of the very unique things is I think people who typically grow up in a more, let's say, traditional environment are introduced to people who they've only heard about like, oh, well, I don't know anyone who's gay, but now I do. Oh, this is just right. a normal person. And they're totally fine yeah, joking right. around about that stuff. Like it's it's fine and it's great. It's just an extra benefit of wrestling that I know I really appreciate and kind of sounds like you do, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's. It was uh, it was a great. It really was. Eight nineteen eighty nine was a great year in my development, not only as a person but also at, in the wrestling business. It it's, uh, it was one of the greatest years until nineteen uh, until twenty nineteen. It was the greatest year I had professionally was nineteen eighty nine. Just to make you feel like shit, uh, nineteen eighty nine. I was two years old. Mm, that's what I thought. Yeah, um, fistful of Rick on Twitter. Uh, says, I've been a fan for years. I still watch old promos from NWA. Ric Flair and mm. Dusty are two of my favorites. Tony, mm-hmm. do you have any AEW favorite promo men or women that you think compared to the old school master promo people from the old school wrestling days? Well, we uh, we don't do uh, the numbers of, of promos that we did back then. We did all days of promo. I mean, we did promos from nine in the, on Wednesdays, nine in the morning, sometimes on Tuesdays, nine in the morning to six at night, all day, bang, 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 bang. So uh, we don't have, we don't do enough. Uh, Cody has done a tremendous job. He did a tremendous job of leading up to the match against Jericho. He did a tremendous job in ring promos of uh, leading up to uh, the match against MJF. Uh, John Moxley has done some sensational interviews. 
uh, leading up to the Eddie uh, Kingston match. And Eddie Kingston has been phenomenal. One of the great talkers, really. I mean, uh, the way he introduced himself to the company was literally on a microphone. And mm-hmm. I don't think there's any better way for Eddie Kingston to join AEW than spitting on the mic. Yeah. Uh, Chris Jericho obviously has done some great things. But uh, to me, the the kid that I, I really hope we uh, cultivate him and uh, polish him up and make him a star is, is Ricky Starks. Oh, 100%. Ricky Starks, man, can do a promo. Oh, yeah. He- and uh, it's... Uh, I just think that uh, he's, uh, I hope we continue to use him because I, I, I think he reminds me of that old school stuff. He he very much does. And I think pairing him with someone like Taz is only going to help propel him to be a bigger star. Right. Just with the amount of stuff I know that he's already learned. And he's got sure. a good attitude and he's got a good look, all that stuff. Let me just put Ricky yeah. over for a minute. Matty Anderson on Twitter. What is your favorite snack? Oh, my favorite snack? Yes. It's Belvitas. 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 B E L V I T. Oh, I was like, the cheese? Like, do they have a fucking cracker or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> oh, like the uh, little breakfast cookies. The little breakfast cookies. Oh, yeah. yeah. Knock off, um, knock off Biscoff cookies. <laughs> right. I, I eat like them, uh, them. Actually, they're, they're much healthier for you than Biscoff. But anyway, I, uh, I, I eat one every morning. Really? It's it's I really couldn't shouldn't call it a snack. It's really my breakfast, a banana biscoff and then about five monsters. Yeah, no, uh, I, so, I don't think I've ever seen you with not a monster in your hand. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, I like biscoffs. I really do. There's a potato chip that you cannot get anywhere. It's called Martin's potato chips made in Philadelphia. It's a ruffled uh, barbecue chip that when I go home to Virginia, my sister always gets for me. You can't get it anywhere, and that's was always my favorite growing up. But uh, man, I love those Bell Vitas, B E L B V I T A. Yeah, and I like the golden notes, mm-hmm. not the cinnamon, not the blueberry, not the pumpkin spice. The golden, the golden. Notes. I like it. Gold is for champions, man. You got it right. We have a question from Lee on Twitter. Hi, Tony. I've been a fan of yours since WCW days, and it's great to have you on AEW. It feels just like home. My question is, how does the energy of AEW compare to what you've done in the past? And who's your favorite wrestler in AEW? Mm. Well, my favorite wrestler in AEW is Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. <laughs> how much is that check for? <laughs> I really do enjoy Britt's company. <laughs> I really do. She makes me laugh. So uh, we have a good time. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I love to laugh. And, you know, that's why I enjoy your company and we laugh and we joke around a lot. Uh, I uh, there's no comparison to what's going on now. Uh, the, the the during the uh, the mid '90s we were we were hot and we were uh, we were uh, we had a good thing going until we uh, screwed it up. And uh, but there was always a sense of dread. Even back in the good times of WCW, I don't get that sense of dread here. And this is the greatest feeling I've ever had doing wrestling since 1989, my year in the WWE. Uh, And even more, 10 times more than that. Uh, And uh, so there's no feeling like this. This is the the best. This feels, you feel like you're part of something. You feel like everybody's pulling the same direction. You feel like uh, no one has an agenda. And I know people have agendas. I get that. Uh, But if they do have an agenda, it's not out front to where it disrupts everybody else. And we we all I always say that in my age that you cannot put a price on being able to work for a good person or good people. And we do. We work for a great person in Tony Khan and we work for great people in Tony and and Mega and Chris Harrington and Nick Sobic and Margaret, all the people who work in the front office, and even Chad Glenn, who's a Florida Gator, and I'll punch him in the nose. Chad Glenn's the best. If I sing. Yeah. Oh, he is? Oh, yeah. And kiss my ass. Oh, okay. no. So anyway. I emailed Chad Glenn no, and say, hey, I need you to okay. send this giant amount of money to AEW Games guys. Yeah. And he goes, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's our no, relationship with guy. Chad Glenn. <laughs> but he is a Florida Gator. I give him a hard time. So what I'm saying is they are all good people, and they're all, we, are, we have such a great, staff behind the scenes, Keith Mitchell and, and uh, Tim and everybody who works behind the scenes uh, 
uh, are they're just great people pulling the same way. So this is the best it's ever been for me on many, many levels. And you cannot compare this to WCW at all. Um, and that's why I think this is going to work. Yeah. I knew WCW was not going to work from day one. I knew that. I had that feeling. Uh, since I've gotten here, I know this is going to work. This would be an incredible question to end the podcast on, but there's one other, and I'm actually very, very interested in knowing the answer to this. Joey okay. Colombo on Twitter asks, how do you keep that luxurious head of hair flowing, luscious and free of gray? <laughs> okay, first of all, Joey, uh, it's not luxurious. It's a very fine, it's very fine hair. I do spray it up. I have never, uh, I have never colored my hair yet. Yet but I know it's going to happen. I know I'll wake up one day and I'll be Ted dancing and everything will be poof. It'll be gray. I do color my beard. Um, and I think I color my beard uh, for a number of reasons. I, I don't like a gray beard. And number two, Lois bitches so much about me coloring my beard that I just like to give her something to bitch about. I like it. Uh, so I, I color it. Uh, but, uh, thanks for saying that. Uh, Larry Zabisco, you say that you say your hair, you have great hair. It's so And great. I said, Larry, I said, Larry, that's because you have none. Ah, uh, there you go. Uh, so maybe in comparison, I don't know, but uh, I've been I've been very fortunate. So follow up question to that, because we were talking about this in the locker room for a bit. There's a number of dudes on the roster who have very long flowing, luxurious hair, but they use fucking pert two in one or whatever it might be. What is what is your uh, shampoo and conditioner of choice? OK, so here's what I thank you for asking me that. There was a time last year where every time I was going to the going taking a shower, there was hair in the uh, there was hair in the drain, and I'm I'm losing my freaking hair. So I went to see my dermatologist, who I love, great lady, and she said a lot of times if you have dandruff, you'll lose your hair. And so she was pulling on my hair. She said, "Yep, you got." I said, "Well, I've never noticed flakes on me," and she said. So she gave me this medicated shampoo that's by a prescription. Mm -hmm. And I use, I've been using that and I've lost no hair since then. So Damn. I use, I use prescription shampoo. Fantastic. You've got the secrets. But I also have another secret. What? I wash my face twice a day and moisturize. That's what you have to do. That's what you got to do. Ah, people just don't understand that. Wash your face twice a day. Properly mm -hmm. moisturized. Although it's not fair because a lot of you dudes can just like take a vino and slather it on and it's fine. And then like I have to go buy a fucking expensive Clinique shit so I don't break out constantly. So fuck you, Tony. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're actually ending this podcast. <laughs> well, fuck you, Aubrey. Fuck you. Uh, this was this was absolutely fantastic. And I'm glad we finally got a chance Thanks. to do it. I've loved uh, doing this podcast with you for the last year. I love... Uh, doing ad reads about erectile dysfunction with you. I mm -hmm. love, I just love seeing you at work and immediately hugging you and commenting on your purple pants. And mm -hmm. just being in your presence is so great because how happy you are radiates. And I think that that is infectious. Like we talk a lot about right. like leading by example. And I think just showing how happy you are is something great that you give everyone else in the locker room. Well, thanks. I, I make it a point to go around and uh, the, the guys' locker room, especially. I'm not going to walk in the, the, the girls' locker room. We don't want your ass in I, there anyway. Uh, well, I think Britt may. Be. But anyway, so I, I make it a point to go in and walk in the guys' locker rooms. We have got a couple of them and say hello to them every time. Yeah. Uh, to let them know that I appreciate them being there. And uh, I I understand that this is my last great ride. And I think it's it's I, I this, uh, 2019. Uh, I can't say 2020 because, uh, well, maybe 2020 because we've we've made things work. But 2019 will go down the the, the greatest year I've ever had professionally in my life. Uh, and uh, I'm really, really uh, thankful for you and for everybody out there to be able to be a part of this. Uh, right. And um, it's it's been a lot of fun. And it's been a lot of fun with you. And I think we're very fortunate to have Stacey Parra with us. Oh, Stacey, uh, our yeah, amazing producer. I think producer. we are because she does does a great job with putting together our podcast and it's been a lot of fun. We've had some good stuff. Some uh, we've really had some good, good stuff, stuff on this podcast and I, I look forward to doing a lot more moving forward. I like in the zoom. I just got a text from her that says, love you guys. Like she's the best, absolutely the best. Anyway, Tony, thank you so much for your time and hanging on always, always like 
spending whether it's five minutes or five hours with you is always great. Uh, you can see Tony commentate on Dynamite every Wednesday, 8 o'clock, 7 central on TNT. And you could follow this podcast, listen to it, subscribe for free wherever you get your podcast. New episodes every Thursday, new uh, video episodes where you can see me flip off Tony on YouTube. Just search for AEW Unrestricted. I'm Aubrey Edwards here with Tony Schiavone. I hope I did you proud, Tony.